everyone, and welcome back. I'm here with really what may be my favorite guest on APT. Dr. Elizabeth Green is joining us here today, and I name drop you all the time on the podcast. I'm, oh, I know. You know, I'm sure you pick it up. But yes, I do. I'm always just like, you know, I'm my doctor friend, like Dr. Green. I love saying Dr. Green. I just think it, it really elevates my status in the world, so... Thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you for the warm welcome. <laughs> oh, you're really welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, so I'm super excited to be here. Good. Yeah, I can't, I've, I've been waiting to come on the podcast forever, and mm-hmm. I love it when you name drop me. It just makes me, like, who, who else gets to listen to a podcast? And then they're just like, oh, yeah, my, my best friend, Alyssa Green. Yeah, that's, that's, that's it's a good feeling. Oh, good, yeah. good, good. We also have Blossom joining us today. Uh, very important subject for today's topic. Um so Blossom, thank you for being here as well. She may make an appearance every now and then. And if you hear her yeah, panting mouth noises in the you know, microphone. It's just it's just this regal cavalier spaniel mm-hmm. joining us today. So thank you, Blossom. You're also a celebrity in my life. And I just appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, can you introduce yourself to the listeners? If you haven't heard me name drop Dr. Green, now you you have a face and a voice. Uh, can you tell everyone what you do and why you're on the podcast today? Yes. So as Bianca said, my name is Bianca's best friend, Alyssa Green. <laughs> and um, we have been friends for what now? 11, 12? I think the fall will be our 12-year friend anniversary. Yes. Okay. So 12, 12 full years. Mm-hmm. Ever since a very fateful day in freshman year biology. Yes. Um, would you like to tell tell that story. I think it's on you. I think you should tell the story because really you are the one that instigated the friendship. I suppose. Yeah. It's all, it's all thanks to me. Um, (laughs) yeah, it's, it's very odd. Uh, well we were in, you know, freshman year biology sitting there. Didn't have a lot of friends. I was new to school. Um, Bianca, I mean, it was high school. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we got, partnered up against our will, I believe, for yeah, a biology Yeah, we, we've been kind of like thing. sitting next to each other in class for a while. And then I feel like it just kind of, everyone else already had their established groups and it mm-hmm. kind of like, yes, we we like did become lab partners, but it was kind of like uh, maybe a little awkward at first. Or yeah, sure. Um, but it was great. And so our uh, project was to dissect a crawfish. Yes. Um, and I don't really know what came over me because I'm actually a a shy person. Um, but I think I just like had like a chemical smell coming from Bianca that I like knew I needed to be her friend. And, um, the perfume, go yeah. back and listen to our perfume episode. So it'll get you a good friend. So it, that's exactly what happened. I smelled you and I wanted to be your best friend. And, um, so we were dissecting this crawfish and I was like, wow, you know, what would be totally cool and normal to do pop the eyeball on my lab partner that I just met. And yeah. that is indeed what I did. And you know what? Ever since then, she hasn't been able to leave me alone. So it's true. It worked. It worked. I just took a little tool. I pop, remember pop the that tool. little. It was like a little. What? It was like a needle. It was like a needle. And she just like picked up the tool and like stabbed yeah. the eyeball. <laughs> and then the, the eye of the crawfish squirted on me. And I was like, like a popping boba, yeah. if you will. <laughs> Ooh, boba tea. Yeah. Some boba tea. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and then I think it was, yeah, pretty quickly after it was that, meant we to became be. best friends. It was meant to be. Yes. And we used to like, while you lived nearby after school and right. like ever, you know, we kind of like would see each other after school and yeah, know, go talk to after Panera, school, go to Panera. Go to and then we had a lot of our classes together mm-hmm. after that. Um, and then we ended up going to college together we lived together for, what was it, like three years? Four years. Is it four? Wow. No, yeah. you didn't live with me freshman year. But then grad school uh, yeah. for a year. Oh, that's amazing. That's I know. Lucky. I know. Yeah. And speaking of lucky, also, you know, like out of Bianca, I had the privilege of meeting Gianna, which is just, you know, the other most fantastic thing that's ever oh, happened yes. to me. So, yeah, I'm very lucky to have been friends with you guys for so long. I know. I'm going to cry. It's yeah. so nice. And, and you know, uh, also lucky – one day, Bianca and I um, just decided to go to New York City for a vacation, um, and that was probably the most magical four days of my yeah. entire life, um, and I was just thinking how wonderful it was, and I was like, yeah, that's really cool, so um, I decided I would move there, mm-hmm. and so... She just decided this. Like, I just Yeah, you guys no, it really was on a whim. She was just kind of like... I'm going to get a job in New York. And then she did. And now she's like a badass 
veterinarian saving lives in the city. She was just like, yeah, I'm going to move here. And then like they hired her, you know, it was like. I literally Googled veterinarian <laughs> emergency New York City. And that's the company I work for now. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, I went to vet school in uh, Oklahoma. And then after that, moved right to New York. Yep. And now I live in Manhattan mm-hmm. with my other true love, Blossom. Mm-hmm. And we're just living our best city girl lives. I love it. I love it. Well, speaking of New York City, I think we should transition in lieu of art news this week. It's very fitting that Alyssa and I are hanging out this weekend and recording because we just watched the Friends reunion. So in lieu of art news, we're going to do a Friends reunion recap, and then we'll get into the bulk of the episode. I'm going to talk with Alyssa about how the arts and pop culture relate to her job as a veterinarian and how the field of science, you can still relate to art and why art is still important. Blossom looks so glamorous. (laughs) She's never had a ring light on. I know, look at that. (laughs) (laughs) And then after that, we are going to play a game where Alyssa, Alyssa's a a pretty good Animal Crossing connoisseur. Yeah, video game in general. It's true. Yeah, she's she's very good. Game of girl, hashtag game of girl. Yeah. And so Alyssa is going to read the description of paintings that she's collected in Animal Crossing. And then I'm going to try to guess which painting it is. So we're going to play that game um, towards the end of the episode. But for now, art news, friends reunion. I just feel as though if you're listening to this and you haven't listened to any friends reunion recaps yet, because I know all of my podcasts already did it last week. But I just want you to know that Alyssa and I are literally the perfect people to talk about the Friends recap. And I don't want to hear anything about, oh, Friends is stupid, Friends is dumb, like chuggy, Friends, girls, whatever. We give no shits. Shamelessly, uh, unapologetically, Friends stands for life. And I, I just feel like watching the Friends reunion was also really interesting in terms of film history because I feel like... When you just, when you watch the show, and if, if it's not your show, that that's totally fine. But I don't want to hear any, like, judgmental bullshit about how, like, the show is dumb and it's stupid. Like, if it's not your show, that's fine. Like, television shows are not for everybody. But what the Friends Reunion did, I think, was really solidify, like, how artful the making of the show was and how, you know, we were talking about, like, the comedic aspect that the behind-the-scenes um reunion kind of gave us that insight into and how it really is an art that these people were crafting and you have to remember that the show a show like that had never been done before and they talked about that in the Mm -hmm. episode how it really followed this kind of new line of developing characters that we hadn't seen like the sitcom really didn't follow this type of like friends dynamic before which is what makes it so iconic. So I think in terms of kind of like visual history and film history, this was really interesting to watch the Friends reunion. And Alyssa and I love Friends. Oh, I should have worn my bracelet. Oh. I have it. <laughs> so on our 10-year anniversary, Alyssa and I took a trip to- New York again. Uh, New York again. <laughs> our second New York And edition. to see Moulin Rouge on Broadway is very, also very important to our friendship. And- for our 10-year friendiversary present, we gave each other Moulin Rouge bracelets that inscripted in like the the chain or like the um the band yeah. was come what may from Moulin Rouge. And we we had no idea that we had gotten each other this, and we each exchanged gifts and it was the same <laughs> gift, and then we realized that we were <laughs> bracelet buddies. <laughs> So I'll pop up the uh, iconic yeah. scene of, is this friendship? I, I think, think so. <laughs> and so Alyssa and I just, we watch Friends all the time when we were living together. We watch Friends all the time as she's been here over the weekend. It's just, it's like comforting. And it's also, I feel like the show has aged so well. There are definitely like some mm-hmm. lines and a few singled episodes where I'm like, Uh, like that's not great but overall the show has aged I think better than any other show of that era I think we were talking about I was talking with someone about Cheers was that you Mm -mm. maybe it was Juliana I was talking about the show Cheers and how sometimes like 
there, there are way more, I think, problematic kind of plot lines in some of those old iconic shows. And it's great that we learn and grow from those things. But I think overall, like I consistently find friends hilarious. I will never stop laughing at the show. It is funny every single time I watch it. And I'm not off put by its aging, I guess the way I am with some other like TV shows and movies. Right. The fact that it's still funny, like 20 years later is actually. It's very impressive. Like it's, it's very impressive on the outset. Um, so, so let's go into it. We have not, we've been waiting all like day and night to recap it. We were struggling last night, not to, after we finished watching it, review, not to talk about it. So give me your thoughts overall as a, as a friends fan, did this like complete all of your wishes? Overall, I was like very, um, pleasantly surprised yeah. with the whole thing really. Like, yeah, I don't know about you. I had such this nervous, like stomach clenching feeling going into it to the point where I was afraid to watch it because I thought it was gonna be awkward I thought it was gonna be like just unnecessary and I wasn't even really excited when I heard they were doing a friend's reunion Mm -hmm. and I must say that I thoroughly enjoyed the whole thing like captivated yeah and um yeah that was that was a great experience yeah I thought it was really good too I was kind of thinking about the Fresh Prince reunion. Did you watch that? I didn't watch that. It was it was really good too. And I, I really liked the Fresh Prince reunion. But was what was interesting about the Friends reunion is that I feel like I feel like it was longer. And the Friends reunion had a host. And at first I was very off put by the fact that they had a host. But now thinking about it, like the Fresh Prince reunion was kind of like hosted by Will Smith because mm-hmm. he's the leading character of the show. And I think that with Friends, they kind of needed James Corden to come in because it really showed them all on like an equal playing field. Right. I'm, sh- I'm sure they could have done it themselves, but like, no, it would have been weird. They needed yeah. someone to ask them the questions and get them going. Right, right. So I thought it, I thought it was fantastic. I, there were points where I was just like cracking up, and then there were other points where I was like falling. Yeah, I definitely up. cried in the first 15 seconds. Oh yeah, like it's just like because <laughs> the ending. I'm gonna cry again. The ending episode like always gets me, you know. And then they started with that, and it's like the music is like a little different. I was like, oh fuck. And yeah. <laughs> I was eating ice cream, and I had to put the ice cream away. I just I couldn't even. I had to completely focus on the reunion. Um, but also like. I loved the bloopers and I love getting to see the behind the scenes interactions. The, yes. the pivot. I know that pivot is like an iconic. I just episode. love seeing them laugh. Right, like but- I did not realize they had such a good time filming. That. I know. I know. But like <laughs> David Schwimmer laughing when he was like actually trying to pivot the couch was so funny. It just like, it brings me joy knowing yes. that like the joy that I get from like, watching the show was also had behind the scenes. Cause it does ruin like a movie or television show for me when I find out that the set was terrible for the yeah. actors and that like it was super complicated and not enjoyable and hurtful. And to know that the the joy that comes through the screen is actually being felt behind the scenes. Just like, I don't know. It was like, right. I feel like that was the main theme of the reunion. Yeah, it was just, it was like, just joy. like how much they all got along and like loved each other when they were filming it right and what it meant to them right you know I think that that was really what they focused on right yeah it was so nice it was so nice um we were talking about some of the things that we wish we could have seen I I could have watched 15 more hours of the friends reunion like Mm. this could have been a mini series and they could have gone like (laughs) 10 episodes season by season I would have thoroughly enjoyed that but I appreciate the friends you know giving us an hour in general Yeah. yeah But we were talking about some of the things like we would have done differently. And where was Colin and Dill Spr- Dylan Sprouse? Colin Sprouse. Colin, <laughs> Dylan, whatever their names are. Ben. Where are, where's Ben? Yeah. And where's ben? I feel like the Bens could have um, been part of the catwalk. I didn't really need like Cara Delevingne. Like, I, I wasn't really sure where they got those people from. Like Justin Bieber is like. Well, Justin stuff, Bieber, but... as soon as I saw him, I was like, where's Cole? Like, what are you doing? I was like, why okay, don't they but have I'm the Okay, I'm pretty bends? sure there's some tea between, like, 
Dylan and Cole's Rouse in the Friends show. I don't know because they always said they had a really good time on the set like, of Friends. Well, no, I guess so. Yeah. So what, were they having a bad time? Because so, I remember reading something about how like they really enjoyed being around Jennifer Aniston when they did the episodes really? like with the, the prank episode. Oh, yeah, yeah. I read something about like how Jen was like really fun for them to be around. Maybe I just read some tea about how they thought that Ross was a bad father, which honestly oh. he was. So, well, you yeah. Know. That's true. But I don't know. I, f- I wish they would have done that. And then the other yeah. thing was I feel like they forgot about Emma a little yeah, bit. Yeah, they didn't even acknowledge one time <laughs> the fact that they had a child together. I know, because Jen was like, I feel like, you know, Ross and Rachel want to have kids. I was like, you do have a kid. Like, you literally have a child together. Yeah. And it was also funny, Alyssa and I were shocked that they were like, oh, yeah, do you, re- do you remember this? Or do you know, do you remember that episode? Like... How could you know? And they didn't, they didn't know. Like, they asked Ross about a specific episode. Okay, Ross, whatever, you know, David Schwimmer. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And he's like, no, I don't remember. I'm like, that's an iconic episode. How dare you not remember? I know. The one where they're throwing the ball? Yes. The one, that's such a great episode. (sighs) Yeah. So, I don't know. I I almost feel like Friends had a stronger impact on me as a viewer than it did on them making the show i know and that was oh, that's so interesting too because i just i when they did the table reads and they were like they had like the script in front of i was like why the fuck do you need a script like oh i know yeah the whole time they were reading the script and we're just like i know this, i literally am I fighting memorized. to not say all of these words right, right now right which is yeah. so i don't know it's just so interesting that like the like the psychological impact and the amount of just friends related dialogue i mean i could if you want to sit here for 10 seasons and I can recite every episode, I just feel like, why do I have that capability? And the people who lived it just neurotic. like, yeah, it's yeah. so wild. I know. But like, yeah, I was saying last night, like I never could watch myself back or something yeah, like that. Yeah. So I understand that they probably aren't obsessed with it to the same level that we are, but that's okay. Yeah. We'll just own up to being obsessed. And yeah, that was part of what the reunion um, focused on as well was the impact that friends has had on a lot of people like not yeah. not in like a silly or funny way but like truly the fact that friends as a tv show um brings a lot of people some serious like comfort yeah. and um brings people together and i think that's true i mean like honestly if i you know i'm like anxious or whatever um just hearing friends or watching mm-hmm. friends in the background i don't even necessarily watch it on the screen but just having that in the background is very comforting yeah and because I, it's just so familiar right i think during covid there were also a lot of conversations about people re-watching television shows and how because you are familiar with those faces and those voices it does psychologically mm-hmm. it actually brings you comfort to re-watch those shows and i think that's why a lot of people spent a lot of quarantine early on re-watching some of those shows that they grew up with or remember loving i mean we watch friends all the time but i still rewatched it during quarantine i mean it is like very relaxing and as those people were talking about it was just i don't know it was really like heartening to see those people who were really struggling at a certain point of their lives and to feel like they had friends or were in that dynamic or part of that dynamic or could in some way relate to just some of the plots that were happening was like really sweet and I I just hope that's translated to the cast and crew like the show is so meaningful and will forever be that way Mm -hmm. you know um another thing we were talking about is which guests we really liked during the reunion I think they had like a good Who's your favorite? Well, I mean, I feel like I have to say Lady Gaga because oh yeah, she was there. She was so cute. The way she just like came in the door and was like, she was so cute. Yeah, she's I know. just adorable. I know, I know. It was so cute. I know that Lady Gaga is a really big Friends fan too. So is she? I really did not know. Uh, that. Yes, yes. Um, so Lady Gaga was great. Tom Selleck yes. and Maggie Wheeler. Maggie Wheeler is so cute. I just yeah, I love my her. personal favorites were um, Monica and Ross's parents. Oh my god, I thought they yes. were adorable. Elliot Gold and Judy Pickles. Yes, they were so cute. They were so cute. They looked just like they used to. I know, and, and they still look like they were the parents. Like, yeah, they just like still looked like they were just like. I just wish they were like married in real life. I know. Elliot Gold was married to Barbara Streisand. What? Yes, I, did not I know. That. I don't think they're married anymore, but they were married for a period. Oh, wow. I know, but he when he, like, kissed her on the forehead, I, I was like, 
Oh my god, that was so cute. I do so think sweet. I actually had tears in my eyes for the whole hour and forty five minutes. Yeah. I know. Because, was... like, by the time they would be ready to dry, they would do something else. I know. Dry. I know. I know. The parents were so cute. If you could have had another special guest join the reunion, because they talked a lot about, like, you know, Sean Penn was there, Brad Pitt was there, yeah. like, the iconic cat, and Robin Williams in the episode. Yes. Um, who would you have liked to see in the reunion? Who's some of your favorite special guests? Um, I mean, I would have liked to see Bruce Willis, especially since he was, like, a character he wasn't just a cameo Mm -hmm. um yeah i don't i i'm surprised he wasn't there honestly yeah that would have been great yeah bruce willis like his storyline may be one of my favorite of the record yeah he was so good it's just like you think of bruce willis as this like serious dude and he comes on and he's just a goober and i love i too am a neat guy (laughs) Yeah, that would have been fun. What yeah, you? yeah. What do you feel like was missing? Um, I feel like Carol and Susan. Yes. I fucking love Susan. Susan is so funny. Yeah, and I, I, I actually saw her. What was I watching? Um, I was watching something, and the actress who plays Susan was in it, and I just like was. She looks great. She looked great. And what was I watching? I'll figure it out. Um, but I was like, oh my god, Susan! It was just like so nice to see her on my screen again. Yeah, and yeah, that would have been that would have been good. Mm-hmm. Well, do you have any other thoughts about the reunion? Anything you want to add? I hope Matthew Perry's okay. Should we talk about Matthew Perry? We shouldn't say anything negative about Matthew Perry because I have seen some articles, first of all, of people who have not even watched Friends, so like the audacity. Mm -hmm. But um, I have seen some articles or whatever talking about this and that, about Matthew Perry and how like people, blah, 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 were concerned let's just cut him a break. I think he's, you know, like he has a history of struggling and let's not make fun of him. And I think that he was doing great. I, my concern about Matthew Perry was that I feel like the other friends are not including him in their lives. (laughs) And like, I just hope he's okay and happy. And like the part where they were talking about how they're all in touch, which honestly I'm not as, that was a little sus. I don't think they all. But they to each all other. hung out. Like, do you remember that photo that they took at like yes. one of their houses? Yeah, like, yeah, I know I that they that. do all hang it's out. It's fine. You don't have to like be BFFs with you know forever. But, but... also, Monica and Ch- Monica and Chandler, Matthew Perry and Courtney Cox were also spotted at a bar like before COVID. Really? Like, yeah, like in 2019, I feel like like it was like a whole article like for days. People were just talking about this encounter that Courtney okay. and Matthew had at a bar. Well, like they nice. just went out for a drink and like they, okay. they were just out together i don't know there's this one part where they were talking about all of them being in touch and matthew perry's like i don't hear from anyone and like everyone else laughed but it's kind of an awkward guilty laugh and i just kind of felt like he was telling the truth oh i know um and then what was the other part where they were talking about like monica's future right what they picture their characters doing the future and monica's like all talking about herself which is great you know um And then Matthew Perry's just like, hello, I just wanted to make sure that I'm still there. Yeah. It was a very Monica and Chandler moment. It was. It was. And it was like, it came across where it could be funny. It could be him joking. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he's probably got a dry sense of humor. But I just hope our little baby Chandler is. Yes. I love Chandler. I love Chandler. Maybe my favorite friend. He really, I, he's not my favorite friend, but I don't know if I have a favorite, but if I had to pick one, it might be be Chandler. (laughs) (laughs) That's an uncommon. Also Joey. Yeah, Rachel I don't know. I, don't I know. know. I, just, I, like I think all. I really relate to Rachel being kind of like oh. dumb and incapable of doing things, yeah, but also like incapable. not incapable of doing things. Like I think I'm incapable of doing yeah. things, but then it's like, oh, well, you can. I'm not. Right. So that's right. why I relate to Rachel. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. like that. I like that. I I do feel like in regard to the Matthew Perry of it all, I feel like the I feel like the reason people are talking about him so much is because he was the one I feel like with the least amount of like screen time over the course of the reunion not that obviously not that he wasn't present but I just feel like I almost feel like they were ignoring him on purpose I don't know I just feel like the editing was so that he just wasn't speaking as much as the other friends and I feel like that comes across to us as like oh something is up but I think it's just the editing I don't I don't know I don't know um also just with all the ageist kind of bullshit that's come out about like after watching the friends union like shut the fuck up like i i just like don't have anything to they're say. literally older they're 
older. Right. And I like, think, why wouldn't they look older? Right. And I think it's just that in Hollywood, you have this idea that, like, especially for for women in Hollywood, but then it makes me feel bad for the men of Friends, too, who just, like, they're they're – they're just human beings. And if we are the type of people who advocate for equality and anti-ageism in the Hollywood system, then stop talking about the way they look. They all looked fucking fabulous. Oh, can I just say something? Yeah. Matt LeBlanc could still get it. And also, oh, truly. He's when so they cute. showed those pictures of young Matt LeBlanc, I couldn't breathe for like 30 seconds. Yeah. I know everyone knows Joey's cute in season one, but like, I think it's the aesthetic, the aesthetic that they give him that I don't really like. Yeah. I, mean, I, I just don't like my men in leather, apparently. Yeah. But um, the, like, what, you know, the acting that yeah. he did in other things and yeah. pictures of him. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, because they always have, like, Joey's always the hot one. And I never thought of Joey as being, like, incredibly hot. Like, I just, he's so cute and I love Joey. But I don't know. There's, when right. he's given that plot line, I've never been, like, yeah, Joey's like the sexiest man on the planet, but oh, oh, I I take that twenty back. something year old Matt Lovelock. Oh yeah, and yeah. he was so he just looked like so happy to be there and like uh, yeah, it yeah, was he's just, still very much as yeah yeah, it was so nice. And but I just think that I think it's it's visually jarring because like we were talking about how we rewatch right. episodes every single day. Yes, I imagine that it's jarring when you watch people age at a young point in their life. So 25 to 35, we have watched that 10 years of their life for so long. And for people like us who watch it constantly, we are used to seeing them, them age in only that time span. So yes, I suppose it's drawing when you're only used to seeing them as they exist in the world of friends, but they are human beings. And I just feel like this conversation around the way they look is like totally unwarranted. And it's like, it's disgusting. Like they Honestly, didn't have that's to give us the friends part of the reason all. that they didn't want to do it in the first exactly. place. Like how do you go from everyone is seeing you in your absolute prime mm-hmm. to just immediately seeing you 20 years older? Right. Yeah. Of course you're going to look older. Right. You're so, a person. Let's all I hope I fucking look like Jennifer Aniston when I'm 55 I years know. old. Like, Jesus Christ. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. But, but it was overall just the most wonderful thing. I've it ever was, experienced. yes, it was truly wonderful. I'm so glad that I got to watch it with you. It just, yeah, it worked out perfect. It really did. Yes. Oh, oh, and where are we going, Bianca? Oh, oh my God. We are going to the Friends Experience in New York City in a few weeks. So yes. I'm just, I'm very excited. We'll post on your story. Oh, yes, we, we will definitely keep you posted. I'm very excited. It's been something we wanted to do for a long time, like ever since we heard of it. We were just yeah. like, we have to go, and now we're going to go. And I'm I'm super excited. Yay. I literally have been wanting to go so bad, but I will not go without Bianca. Wow. So I've been waiting. Awesome. Yes. Okay, cool. So are you ready to transition in today's art pop talk? Absolutely. Okay, sweet. So I'm going to ask Elizabeth about um, a few questions about her work, her life as a veterinarian, and how that actually is relatable to art history and how people who are working in other fields other than art should and, and often do have an impact on our visual culture and our visual art history. So Alyssa, Can you talk a little bit more about your job and how being a veterinarian impacts or or impacts you in a world of visual arts? Yeah, so just like a quick intro for what I do. Um, I am an emergency veterinarian only, um, so I don't do any of the normal, you know, veterinarian stuff that you think about. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I see dogs and cats and other animals um, on an emergency basis. Um, What's so, the weirdest animal you've done an emergency procedure on? Uh, a, a guinea pig? I don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. I've seen like owls and falcons and, you know, New York City yeah, doesn't the anim- have that much yeah. wildlife, right. I guess. So it's yeah, all dependent true. on like who has some sort of weird exotic creature. Mm-hmm. I know that in Florida, in our clinics in Florida, they see some Would you operate on an stuff. alligator? I would kill an alligator. When I we were in Florida, alligators. she was very scared of the gators. Yeah. I I actually am still scared of the alligators, like even here. Really? I just, you know, you never know when one's going to get you. Alligators and you sharks, man. Sharks? I hate sharks. Really? I didn't know that. They're fantastic for the environment. I would never, like, purposely oh, kill no, one, no, but no. don't you dare bring that to my clinic. Yeah. Could you operate on a shark? Absolutely not. 
Interesting. Absolutely not. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Where was I going with this? Um, Talking about what you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In so this mostly it's dogs and cats. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's, it's really great. Um, I mean, definitely, mm-hmm. I think that my job is um, influenced by, um, you know, all the dog culture that we see around us. Mm-hmm. And even in the last few years, um, I really think that the culture around having <sighs> pets Ew, that is my dog coughing. <laughs> Blossom is having a <laughs> moment over here. Anyway. Ruining my audio. Yeah. Um, I think that veterinary medicine has really been influenced by the culture that we have our, our pets in. And mm-hmm. <laughs> come here, Blossom. Come She's here, Blossom. Hungry. Ew. <laughs> She no. guys could see she just did the dog thing where she rubs her butt all over the floor. I'm sit here, right so here. Now, she, now right. she's here. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so for some reason, in the last few years, we have decided, you know, as a collective community that um, dogs are just, it, well, dogs and cats. I don't want to, I don't have a cat. I like cats. She has a, she has a god I have a god cat. Um, but, you know, I have a dog and I guess I just focus mostly on dogs. Um, the, the culture that has surrounded pet ownership recently yeah. has been pretty insane. Mm-hmm. I mean, the whole dog mom, cat mom. Um, oh, yeah. When, like stickers and right. It's, chains it's all and... about in the whole like, oh, millennials don't want kids. They want dogs and cats. Because we can't afford it because we don't have a living wage. And also kids are gross and disgusting. We hate them. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so your pets are your kids. And yeah. so the role of a veterinarian definitely has evolved from a caregiver a medical caregiver to like almost a pediatrician which is yeah kind of freaky really high pressure yeah um but i yeah just like the the culture of animal ownership recently has really made it a different sort of career than i expected yeah yeah that's super interesting so at our pop talk i think it's really you're you're i think you're really our first guest who hasn't had Um, a a background of study in the arts. And I think it's Mm -hmm. really important for us to talk to those people who don't study the arts, but appreciate it and acknowledge how visual culture impacts them. Because I think that's like a very frustrating stereotype about working in the arts is that like, I only connect with people who understand the field of art and can kind of like relate to talking about it. So can you talk a little bit more about how, as you you work in your field and as you see these kinds of changes happening in your field, how do you find yourself kind of connecting with the arts and, and pop culture as well? I mean, we were talking about kind of references and film and TV and not just art history, but like how you insert yourself and make a point to insert yourself into visual culture and how that could even like help relate to your patients like how does that help you as a doctor how may that help kind of visual learners how can you explain like what's happening with their pet through anything you know surrounding us visually <laughs> I had that was a train a, of thought going that was so. a very long question I apologize <laughs> what was the beginning of the question <laughs> I just want to know more about how you not having a background in the oh, arts right, right, right. has like impacted you as a veterinarian and as someone who absolutely appreciates art. Cause yes. anytime we go out, I'm always dragging her to an art museum, but right. she really likes no, it's it. Great. And like, yeah. Like and you having... have such an eye, you have like a very specific taste and yeah. outside of like animal culture too. But I, as you know, the, the common citizen do appreciate a good <laughs> piece of art and um, having, a, you know, best friends who are so involved in the arts um, has really opened a lot of doors and, you know, just for appreciating it. Um, I love going to museums with Bianca mm-hmm. because it's literally like having a personal tour guide. It's like, oh, what's this about? And I get so much more info than I would ever have gotten from, you know, like the little placard on the wall. Um, so, the placard, you know, that's the, whatever the, yeah. The so. label? I've never heard anyone call it a placard. Well, that's cute. I thought that's what it was called. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so you know, I, obviously anyone can enjoy art, but as far Mm -hmm. as it relates to like animals, um, I, I really, obviously there's so much historical 
um, art that includes dogs and cats and other animals, mm -hmm. but even um, in a more modern sense, you know, dogs in movies and literature and pop culture. Yeah. Um, I think that that really has an influence on, on my work. Um, you know, there's documented surges in breed popularity due to certain movies that come out. That's 101 Dalmatians, fascinating. Um, Lassie, oh, whatever. Cruella just came out too. I yeah. And I actually read an article that was like, please don't buy a Dalmatian because that's what happened when um, wow. the first movies came out that like everyone went and got a Dalmatian. And yeah. No hate against Dalmatians, but they're not for everyone. And right. um, it really leads to, unfortunately, like poor breeding practices and irresponsibility. Wow. Um, so that definitely influences what I do and how I have to, you know, be aware of certain right. breed issues. Um, but yeah, no, that's good. That's good. <laughs> what else was the question? You asked a long question. I'm questions. sorry. I'm sorry. That was a very long winded question. I apologize as a, as a host. I should, <laughs> I should keep it more concise, but no, I think that's great. I'm just, I'm, I'm always trying to break through to other people who, are in fields different from, and when we were in college, you know, and we lived with scientists and engineers, like, mm -hmm. you know, for several years <laughs> and like, it's, 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 I don't want to say like a constant struggle, but I'm, I feel like I'm always kind of having to like justify myself to other people who work in mm -hmm. like STEM. You guys know, I hate that word, like use steam, please. So I, I feel like it's important for us to just have those conversations about like how, like you said, like our visual world does impact your field and we can still talk about that and we can still have like meaningful conversations, even though like, I don't know anything about art. You know what I mean? I like, don't say that. It's not super productive. You know things about art. You just may not know like the backstory. You right. Know? And but like, you're like, I don't know everything about art either. And appreciate it. <laughs> right. Sure. No one knows everything about art. But if you like it, then like learn about it. Yeah, definitely. So you just went to the Museum of the Dog in New York City. I and did. I, I want to hear about everything about the museum. Yes. If you didn't know that this existed, like I did not know it existed until I got a targeted Facebook ad. Um, <laughs> it exists. And it's close to Grand Central Station. Um, it's a fairly decent sized museum for mm -hmm. it just being about dogs. Um, but yeah, it's like two stories. Um, it is all about dogs. I didn't see a single cat. Oh. Um, is there a museum of the cat? I don't know. I haven't looked for it. Probably why, not. why would a museum of the dog be better than a museum of the cat? Because dogs are better than cats. That's the tea. Um, anyway, <laughs> so no, yeah, it's, like um, it. got, it has like a pretty extensive collection of historical art, um, classic art you know not that's not cool. so much modern really mm -hmm. um a lot of portraiture uh-huh that's um, cool so you know it's it's got a pretty extensive collection it also uh, i thought it was cool that it has um interactive exhibits one of them you could scan your face and it would tell you what breed you looked like would you like to guess a breed i'm still not okay i'm still actually really sad about it I did have my mask on, to be fair, but okay. Would so, you like to guess? So you didn't get a spaniel, I'm guessing. No, I actually it was very insulting. Okay, I feel like the most insulting breed I can think of, just personally, because I I don't like these dogs. I'm not this type of dog. Mm. I feel like I'm gonna go pug. Not a pug. It is actually it's a dog you like. <gasps> it's a dog I like. Yes. Is it a Vishla? No. That's my favorite kind of dog. His name would be like Meatloaf. <gasps> a bulldog. Yeah, you an English bulldog? bulldog. Do I look like an English bulldog? <laughs> What the hell? That's so rude. But you're so cute, Alyssa. Bianca! Do I look like an English bulldog? No, that's so cute. I feel like you're so cute. Like, when I just love them so much. It's wrinkly. I do not look like an English bulldog. You don't look like What do like I look like? <sighs> do you look like Blossom? I don't know. Something with like a round face, not a hound. Mm -hmm. Definitely not like a hound. Um, something with like a more, I don't know, like a rounder face. And you have curly hair. I do have curly hair. Um, not like know. a poodle. Well, you have a nose kind of like a poodle. Okay. Um, I would love to be a poodle. Yeah. You have like a very like pristine nose and you're very like, um, like posh, I feel like. And she does have curly hair. Um, you can't see it right now, but she does have. Yeah, I'm a catfish. <laughs> 
So maybe, maybe like a okay. mini, oh, maybe like a miniature poodle. Oh, yeah. Okay. That, that might be really good. Cool. Yeah. I hate those dogs. No, I don't. I love them. There's, I want like a big poodle, like a giant A standard ass. poodle. Yeah. Yes. That's I would I rather be a standard poodle. Oh, okay. Or like an Afghan hound. I, see, I was going to say. My hair is not pretty enough. I hate hound. them, but I feel like I would be an Afghan hound. You kind of would. You're very because, tall. Because, like, my, my nose, I feel like, is, like, sure. like long. Like, I feel like I have a long face. And, and my I hair long... is actually naturally beautiful. Oh, that's so, so nice. Yeah. And, I'm, yeah, I have long limbs. Mm-hmm. So, I feel like I would or be. Or a greyhound. But you should be an like Afghan hound. It's like either. a greyhound with beautiful hair. Yeah, they're not my favorite. Yeah. I'm, like, beachless. Okay. Well, you're not a beachless. No, no I'm not. It's fine. <laughs> Not as beautiful. Anyway, so that was insulting. But um, <laughs> then there was this, like, table where there were all these dogs floating around, and you could, like, drag them into the doghouse and learn about them. Oh, cool. Naturally, I spent most of my time on the Cavalier Spaniel. But it had all these categories, like, origin, health, mm. like, their benefits as, like, a pet, you know, yeah. blah, blah, blah. They had all these breeds, and it was really fun to learn about all of that. You know, I just appreciated that they put the time and info into making that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was an exhibit upstairs where you could train this virtual dog to, like, sit and play fetch and, like, all that oh, kind of stuff. Oh, that's cute. So, yeah, it was fun. Um, and then they have rotating exhibits. So the one that they had there was actually dogs in media, basically. So oh, cool. So they did have an exhibit on Lassie and Beethoven and Snoopy and, oh, you know, all that cool. sort of stuff and that's all of the really original cool. movie posters. So um, that was interesting to learn about you know yeah I feel like I'm always asking you about which dog would make a good pet or like I, w- I want to know m- more about like certain breeds and like yeah. I'm always asking like oh I love the way this do- like bulldogs like I-, I think bulldogs are so cute but Alyssa's is like yeah you know that episode of SNL with Debbie Downer and they're all at Disney World and she's <laughs> like <"Wah."> you know <laughs> That's me whenever anyone talks about getting a dog. They're like, I want a golden retriever. I'm like, oh, are you ready for cancer? Oh my God. <laughs> That's so, terrible. yeah, it's actually really bad. I need to stop doing that. But it's it, for me, it's useful because I feel like I'm I'm coming into the, I think the, the hound range. Yeah, seems, no, no. The one, Avisha is pretty healthy. I will say, you know, as someone who didn't take their own advice because I have um, a, an expensive dog that, is prone to becoming sick. Um, <laughs> I would say definitely you should adopt a shelter dog mm-hmm. because there's something called hybrid vigor. And literally it is the scientific concept of, you know, mixing breeds makes them the healthiest value or the, what is it? The healthiest, um, you know, like, m- like most valuable because they're taking, yeah, like, like everything that comes through like is the like best the best of, of the best. It's and like so as what's happening mix... with like making babies right now, like yeah, um, like, picking your own genes and stuff. Right. So the best genes are what comes through with mixed breed dogs. So if you want a healthy dog that's unlikely to get sick, get a shelter dog. That's awesome. Yeah. Don't buy an expensive ass Cavalier Spaniel. <laughs> a bougie bitch over yeah, But hey, she's cute. She is very cute. She's a very good dog. Um, so the last question that I, I kind of want to talk to you about, I, I hopefully this won't be like so long-winded. But Just break it up into sections, please. Okay, I'll break it up into sections. Well, I want to talk, kind of go back to that idea um, that you were talking about earlier with like animal art. And um, if you show people your pop socket, is it Miss Blossom on your, on your pop um, socket? Yeah, but... The... Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's like a little worse for wear. Oh, here's my Museum of the Dog sticker. Oh, cute. So, oh, that's cute. So I, I feel like animal portraiture has also taken on like its own genre of art. And I, and I think that very much exists within the portrait genre of art history. I feel like every time I go to a museum and I see like a lady with her lap dog, you know, I'm always sending snapshots to Alyssa because I want to know more about this dog. Or I think it's so interesting that you can gauge history and history of breeding like you were saying through art history and like is that information valuable to you as a vet like when like have you ever been in class and they like bring up a like an old portrait of no but that would be amazing that would be really cool but I feel like you need an art class and I agree I very much agree um you can definitely see the history of breed development through portraiture Mm -hmm. um you know even for example the cavalier spaniel so blossom is a cavalier king charles spaniel there used to be a king charles spaniel Mm -hmm. which was uglier um you know a shorter nose just like not 
not cute. You know, I mean, it's cute. It's very cute. But like most people wouldn't agree. Um, and you can see back in the day, and that st- that breed still exists. But back in the oh, day, okay. that's one of the ancestors of the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. So the farther back you get, um, you see you know these dogs over the years their mm-hmm. snouts become longer they become bigger mm-hmm. and, and that happens with all sorts of breeds um you really can see the development of basically mm-hmm. you know they used to be used for a certain purpose now mm-hmm. they're used for a different purpose yeah. or um or now they're used just for companionship you yeah. know um so you can see them develop over the years and then you know also i my favorite thing is seeing you know the little dogs that used to be little just status symbols like a chinese crested i I love chinese crested beautiful gorgeous um so watching them you know with their their lovely regal lords and ladies and their purpose is literally just to exist and be cute and i love it we stand i don't think they had the mark that's kind of what i want to be um just cute and exist (laughs) um so that's my favorite is like, i follow this mm-hmm. dogs in art instagram account and i, oh, see I love all that these, account like, fancy ladies with their fancy dogs i'm like oh that's me oh that's me oh that's me <laughs> so i love that i really appreciate a good um ornamental dog oh you know? yeah that's really interesting yeah. Oh. and yeah it's like you could only afford certain dogs right and even now you they're see a status that. symbol so for dogs sure today are very much status symbols take the French bulldog, for example, this lady guy you can't go out on the street with your French bulldog. You better bring mace or a knife because someone's going to steal it from you. Right. Right. You know? And yeah, Lady Gaga obviously, unfortunately experienced that, but, um, French bulldogs are thousands of dollars and mm-hmm. you really, it's a status symbol. It's like having yeah. an expensive watch or yeah. anything else, you know, that's so interesting how just any type of dog, like even looking at a golden retriever like you look at it and you have these like visual associations of like a white you know midwestern family and their golden Mm -hmm. retriever i think that's a super interesting point yes yeah all dogs really do put off their own you know concept of whatever that owner is and of course it's not always accurate but but we still nevertheless have those like perceived notions of what that dog means to its owner just like we do in animal portraiture so when we when we walk into a museum and we see these like associations like you're saying with lap dogs or um you know wealthy kind of noble men and women with featuring portraits not only could they afford to have their portrait taken but they could afford mm-hmm. to have their portrait taken with this accompanying symbol of, right. of sadness and there were even dogs that were illegal for the public to own like i believe the Pekingese in China was uh-huh. like a guardian of the temple, I believe oh, is correct. Wow. Um, or on, like only the royal elite mm-hmm. could own them. Wow. Um, so there, and, and there were quite a few dogs like that, that were really only allowed to be owned by royalty or they were considered wow. um, basically like a spiritual sort like, of breed uh-huh. that you, just the common person really wasn't allowed to have. Wow, that's so interesting. Or yeah, even thinking about, um, animals in association with like gods and goddesses and and in our history we see that a lot like with um olympia manes olympia for example we have a cat and a cat in art history is kind of this symbol of licentious behavior so it, olympia of course we have i don't know i have her hanging on my wall up here but um we have this cat that kind of symbolizes like a, a woman's infidelity and things like that but in you know something like a portrait of a married couple we have the dog that we see and the dog always symbolizes this um, meaning of of loyalty. So it's really interesting how also in art history have dogs and cats, you know, come off with with different meanings. So you you have these status symbols and symbols of wealth, but you also have these like other meanings that animals are, mm-hmm. are specifically placed yeah, very in symbolic. portraiture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then we were also talking about, um, before we started recording, I'm thinking about hunters in the snow and how we have this kind of like, I want to say gaggle of dogs. Gaggle. dogs. I don't know what a herd, a herd, a herd of hounds like these. We a have pack, the, a pack. I don't know. What's the <laughs> year of it? Yeah, it's a pack. Um, well, we have this like least. group of, of hound dogs and hunters in the snow and that, how that also, um, that imagery is like passed down and i I think like most people know if you obviously if you 
get like a hound dog, you might know that it's used for like hunting and things like that. But it's really interesting to also see that in something like art history and how that is actually translated through through science, you know, and what artists and artisans like create out of these other meanings from animals. So the other thing I was curious about is actually as we were walking around town the other day we were like looking in the windows of galleries and there was this whole section of this gallery dedicated to animal portraiture and i just wanted to like get your gauge on on animal portraiture and i guess like you were talking about earlier like this like newfound kind of fascination with our own pets and and how we were talking about how they really feel like they're children yeah. for for people like us and people in our age group or for people who can't or don't want kids but it's just really fascinating to see this kind of emergence of animal portraiture specifically as a genre of visual culture and what i think will be passed down into a genre of our history so we're, we're not just seeing portraits of people with their animals but people now are paying to have portraits done of their animals just like they might have paid like a photographer to take family portraits or, or been wealthy enough to have someone paint portraits of their children or their whole family mm -hmm. like do you experience that with like a certain type of clientele like how do you feel about this like rise in animal portraiture because like we we do it and we should yeah you know, no i mean socket, i have a pop you know? socket of blossom i have um a bag you know my bag that has your yes, face on it, it yes, says blossom i had it custom designed <laughs> i have all kinds of um, Cavalier Spaniel merchandise, like yeah. a makeup bag with Cavalier Spaniels on I it. I always look for Cavalier stuff. I, I have a that. tattoo of a Cavalier Spaniel. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm just as sick as all the rest of them. Yeah. So I, I think love that's, it. That's really interesting for artists too, thinking about like, like you were saying, you paid to have this back like custom made. I just think it's interesting that there's a, a group of artists who do this type of work, like that is also a means mm -hmm. for that's their whole thing yeah art practitioners to actually like make a viable living i don't know they're right. just like the transition from like people to animals is super interesting and, yeah and, no like, i love it i have zero problems with everyone wanting to have their dogs and cats and everything um preserved in art i think it's really great i do think that you know it's something special to have and it's something that we've been focusing more even in, in veterinary medicine like not to be a downer but you know when when animals uh when owners have to put their animals down yeah we make sure they have a nice like paw print we you know give them i'm a pet stuff. mortician <laughs> they have pet morticians so like really it's it's crazy it's just it, i think that lately people have really recognized and understood and appreciated just the value that pets mm -hmm. bring to their owners and it's totally okay if like your pet is your baby and i don't yeah. want to hear it from people who are like oh the word dog mom is offensive no it's not right i am a mother and blossom is my baby also you don't like there are just so many circumstances behind parenthood like don't right. stop like passing judgment on people like you don't know what their status someone or what doesn't want to have kids or, they or their ability or like you don't yeah. and also the cost i'm just gonna say like yeah no she's you expensive yeah. but she is not a human child and i spend right. nowhere near as much on her and it's yeah great. but like so i get like literally motherhood. can't afford to have children right. so shut up yeah just absolutely not yeah yeah cool well are we ready to take a little break? And then when we come back, we're going to play a little Animal Crossing game. I would love to play some Animal Crossing. All right, I'm excited. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to play a little game uh, where Alyssa, a very extensive game player, I would say, in my book. Um, I dabble. You dabble. I dabble. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She has been playing Animal Crossing and building up her island, and she is going to read me the descriptions of the art that she has collected, and then I'm going to try to guess which piece of art it is and I'm very excited and I have to just first of all this is the perfect combination like Animal Crossing and art I just feel like it's like wow. you wouldn't it's think like, but no, it's yeah. so fantastic and I'm just I'm also really excited like you know over the course of quarantine you and Juliana 
were kind of initially sending me like, oh, like this is so cool. This is an animal crossing. Right. You can like collect this piece of art and decide if it's a fake or not. And I think that's a really just other interesting and very cool dynamic that Animal Crossing is bringing. And also like, you know, game culture and kind of like, quote unquote, nerd culture, like we've talked about with um, Whooper and Nebula. I mean, I just, I think like this crossover is, is really cool. And, and I'm just, I'm a big, big fan of it. Yeah. So, and this was all Alyssa's idea. Thing I really just want to play Animal Crossing. So, okay. Are you let ready? me just explain Animal Crossing real quick to those yes. who have not had the fortunate chance to play it. So Animal Crossing um, has really existed over multiple platforms. I believe it's more of like a Nintendo based uh-huh. platform, but you know, the GameCube and the Wii and the Switch now. Um, I started playing Animal Crossing when I was, I don't know, five, eight, I don't know, a baby. And um, oh. I played it on the GameCube and it really, it has kept the same concept over mm-hmm. the years. Do you always have a museum? Yeah. Like, do so you remember you, there, you've always had a museum, oh, but the cool. art feature, I believe is new on oh, the cool. Switch version, Animal Crossing um, New Horizons. So um, the goal of Animal Crossing they say there is no goal, like there's no way to beat the game. You basically move to an island, you're a human, all your villagers are animals, and your goal is to pay off the mob boss, Tom Nook. He's a <laughs> raccoon or something. A capitalistic and, key. Yeah, so you move to the <laughs> island, he's like, oh, I'll give you this house for $5. And <laughs> so you take it, of course, because that's a fantastic deal. And then he's like, oh, you won't be... Fifteen dollars now. Yeah, then and the next step, he's like ninety-eight. <laughs> I'm literally in coins. two million bells worth of debt on my house right now. Yeah, but I have a really great house. Um, <laughs> so the goal is just to like pay off your house. Every time you pay off your house, he adds like a new room, and you're mm-hmm. back in debt. Um, but you know, you also want to on your island or wherever you mm-hmm. are, collect all of the bugs, collect all the fish, collect now all of the art pieces, mm-hmm. and complete your museum. So. I think that the museum, honestly, is the most enticing and the coolest part of Animal Crossing because they use real life things. So Mm -hmm. all the fish and bugs and fossils and art are real things you can find in the world. Um, And just like the amount of knowledge that Mm -hmm. I have about things I didn't know existed, Mm -hmm. um, honestly, specifically the fish and the insects, like Mm -hmm. all these sorts of fish, I'm not a fisherman. (laughs) <laughs> and now I know they exist. So I think it's really cool. Mm-hmm. Like, really, I, it's yeah. there are fish that I'm like, that is a cool fish. Mm-hmm. I didn't know they existed on mm-hmm. the Animal Crossing. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, you know, same thing with the art. So um, every mm, two weeks or so, mm-hmm. this, this little fox, his name is Red, um, he comes Spicy. to your island mm-hmm. and he is in a boat. And you can go in the boat and he has, it's very shady. The whole thing's very shady. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a few pieces of art that you can look at and you can buy them. Um, and you are in charge of deciding or determining if they are fake art or real art. Mm-hmm. And you're able to look at them up close. You can zoom in, mm-hmm. everything. But the the catch is that they're labeled like, amazing painting or fantastic painting they're not labeled like you know whatever so you can't just the title, google it so you can't look it up so there have definitely been pieces of art where i don't know what it is i've oh. never seen it before and you can't just okay. be like three people in a field like <laughs> it doesn't it, it's hard to google that and so yeah you end up doing research and i don't know that's i'm sure cool. a lot of people who don't care just buy the art and figure out if it's but really that's or not. cool that people are really like yeah. searching for right art history um i mean i'm sure there are cheat there are, there are definitely cheat cheats. things online you can just look at the, yeah. the art guide but you know, it's not as fun um so i have a not an extensive but a decent collection of art that i've okay. bought from red um, and you know, he mails it to you the next day. So you don't know until the next day if it's fake or real until you bring it to my man Blathers, the owl who yes. is in charge of the museum. You give it to him and he's you're like, Oh yes, this is a real amazing painting. Uh-huh. Or he's like, I was like, not get out of here, that's trash. Ooh. So um yeah, so anyway, I've I've collected a, a few really decent pieces. Okay. And um i'm curious to see if you're i'm nervous skilled and knowledgeable <laughs> enough to know what they are based on their animal crossing description okay so i'm going to read the placard as some call it 
um, next to the people (laughs) next to the painting, and you just tell me if um, you know what that is. I like a pin myself. (laughs) Okay, are you ready? Yes. All right. One, two, three, go. Okay. This is the amazing painting. Okay. The amazing painting. This masterpiece, painted by 17th century Dutch artist Blink, depicts a military gathering. At the time, portraits usually show their subjects standing still, so this was a leap forward in technique. For many years, art scholars thought that the painting was set at night, but a restoration revealed a dark varnish. We can now see the dynamic poses and lighting as they were meant to be seen in the daytime. Oh, yeah. Which <laughs> painting is that? Okay, 17th, 17th century, you mm-hmm. said. Um, Dutch Dutch painter, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Um, who likes to work with light? Who likes to work with light? I feel like... Oh, my gosh. I feel like I want to go Rubens. Nope. Okay. It's an R name. It's an R name? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um... Um, a military, I was, a military gathering. A military gathering. It's a bunch of guys, they're in a room wearing fancy hats and mustaches. They all have those, like, doily collars on. Oh, Um, oh, um, 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 oh my god, I feel like I can, I feel like I can picture it in my head. Is it Roigel? No. Oh, okay, no, that's not what I was saying. Okay, I lose. Um, it's, um. (laughs) <laughs> the Night Watch by Rembrandt. Oh, motherfucker. <laughs> oh my god, wait. I think in my head I was getting... Wow, that's really embarrassing. That's the okay. Night Watch. You have time to make up for it. <laughs> okay, oh this is a good one. This is a good one. Okay, okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. Quaint painting. Quaint painting. Okay. This is... Uh, this piece earned blank the nickname Master of Light thanks to its exquisite contrast oh. and depth. Okay, I feel like I'm going to go, is it Caravaggio? No. Blank painted this masterpiece at only 25 years of age. Many note that it's surprisingly small in real life. Oh, is it the Mona Lisa? No. Surprisingly small in yeah. real life. I mean, it's about the same size as my animal crossing character, if that helps. Um, can you read it again? Yeah. This piece earned Vermeer the nickname Master of oh, Light. Oh, Vermeer. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, is it Girl with the Pearl Earring? It's not, but it's in the same room. Well, Vermeer I learned only has... I watched the Girl with the Pearl Earring oh, recently. Oh, Girl with the... I feel like Vermeer only has about like 19 paintings or something like well, that. Well, it's one of the 19. Oh, is it Woman at the Window? She's standing by a window, but oh. that's not what it's called. Okay. Um, can I see what it is now? Yeah, it's called the milkmaid. Oh, the milkmaid. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. This is going to be terrible. I bet you'll get this one, though. I bet you will. The okay. little boss. <laughs> oh, I really thought you were going to get that one. <laughs> this one's called Warm Painting. Warm Painting. It is said that this painting is a more discreet version of an earlier work known as the... Mm, that's, that's a clue. The oh. Blink. It is also known that Blank was quite popular in his own time. Could these facts be related? A third unrelated fact, the word Blank refers to a stylish young lady of Madrid. A stylish lady of Madrid. Mm -hmm. Um, She's she's laying like this. Okay. So a reclining nude. She's not nude. She's not a nude. Okay. Um, wow, those clues, that, okay, the clues in this one, I feel like, are harder than the other ones. Can you read it again? Sure. I'll give you one of the clues. Okay. It is said that this painting is a more discreet version of an earlier work known as the Nude Maja. Ha, ma, ha. Ma, ha. (laughs) Maja. (laughs) Okay, it's called The Clothed Maja. Or Maha. I really don't know. Oh, I've never... You guys seen that? No, I don't know I, I've never seen it before. I've never either. seen that okay, one. Well, now okay, well, now we know. Look it up. It's, okay, it's really nice. on the screen. I've never... Who's it by? Um, oh, yeah, I should say. Oh, Francisco de Goya. Oh, Francisco Goya. Oh, I've never seen that yeah, before. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I like it. Okay, okay. Oh, Spanish. Okay, that... I was trying to figure out, like, a clue with the yeah. Madrid, mm-hmm. but okay, okay. Um, Do you want one you're not going to get? Cool. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's do go this one real it. quick. It's called The Glowing Painting. Glowing Painting. A famous piece by, I'll give you the artist even, okay. Turner. Okay. A painter of light. 
It shows an English Navy ship commanded by Admiral Nelson as it's being tugged towards its dismantling. Okay, I feel like this one is difficult because all of Turner's works look the same to me. And Turner has a lot of kind of seascape and- Yeah, it's very uh, seascape. Uh, he also did like um, the the London Bridge burning, but it's like, he has a lot of views kind of from the water. So yeah. that one I probably would not it's get. It's called the Fighting Timoraire. It's a boat in the water. Boat in the water. We like it, but we don't love it. Sorry, Turner. It's not um, my favorite. Okay, here's a good one. Okay. Moody painting. Moody painting. Blank painted this piece of a farmer sowing wheat seeds in a field after moving to the countryside from Paris. Okay. If the piece reminds you of a Van Gogh, that's likely because Van Gogh himself was inspired by it. Is it Corbet's The Sower? It is. Good job. Wait, Corbet? Millet. Oh, Mie. Mie. Millet. Mie is the sower. Cool. But it is the sower. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Here's another one. Common painting. Common painting. This signature uh. piece from Millet, <laughs> who was known for depicting the lives of commoners in the 19th century. Is it the Gleaners? Yes, it is. Ah, okay. That would be the one that I had to Google three people standing in a field. Uh, did it work? Actually, when you said that, yeah. I was like... <laughs> I feel like I know one that could work for that. <laughs> yeah. Good job. Mm. Okay, this is one of my favorites. Okay, I got one. Wait, you got two, right? You got oh, two yeah, from yeah. Mie. Okay. Okay, this is called Sinking Painting. I think this one's lovely. I did not know of this one Sinking painting. before okay. Animal Crossing. Um, blank is a tragic figure in the Shakespearean play Hamlet. Okay. There is an otherworldly expression on her face as she lies unconscious in a river. She is surrounded by the beauty of nature as she floats between life and death. Okay, is it Waterhouse's Ophelia? It's Ophelia, but it's Melies. Jo John. Oh, Edward okay, Melies. okay. So it is Ophelia. Yeah. A different version than yeah. I was thinking. Okay. But I think it's just lovely. It's very beautiful. Yeah. And I'm saving my. Okay, this is my other favorite. Okay. This is another one I didn't know existed until Animal Crossing. And this is, honestly, I would literally hang this in my house. It's okay. fantastic. Um, oh. Okay, this is called proper painting. Proper painting. Close inspection of the mirror behind this painting subject reveals many mysteries and paradoxes. I feel like I know. In fact, the painting is based on multiple perspectives, which explains the unusual placement of some items. Sadly, this is Blank's last major work. He passed away a year after it was complete at age 51. Okay, is it Manet's Barth of Folies Berger? That is exactly right. Ah! I think that is just beautiful. I fucking love this painting. There is like so, like art historians just like gravitate toward this painting because it's like the idea of like the unknown and like the trickery of the eye. And if you look in the mirror, yeah. the mirror does not reflect what's happening it in totally your doesn't. space. So there's a very big controversy in the art world amongst, there's a lot of uh, dialogue between art historians about what is happening in the painting. Is that a mirror or is it not? Or are we looking at like, um, kind of a reality and a perceived reality mm. from the perspective of the bartender. I love yeah, that like, painting. Yeah, like, are you the man in the mirror when you're looking right. at the painting? Right, or not, because you wouldn't be able to see yourself. But you'd you were... have to be the man in the mirror. I don't, unless it was at an angle. I don't or know. there's another girl in the background that looks a lot like this girl. I no, love possible. Manet. I think that's I really love Manet, awesome. yeah. Ooh, okay, I'm, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. good, good, good. Okay, we got a couple more, and okay. then we have the big finale. Yeah. How am I doing? Okay. You're good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, this one's called flowery painting. Flowery painting. Blank painted this piece when he moved to the south of France in search of more vibrant colors. Yellow was Blank's favorite color and he made seven paintings featured Blank's during this time. I'm gonna go Van Gogh sunflowers? Yeah. Okay. Good job. Okay, this one's hot take, kind of boring. Perfect painting. Perfect? Yeah. Mm, we'll see. This still life is known to have inspired the work of many other artists, including Pablo Picasso. Rather than trying to recreate an image, Blank captured the beauty of shapes from many angles. With this work, Blank draws on both the atmosphere of his subjects and the spirit of its beholders. Okay. Um, is it by Cezanne? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. Good job. I love Cezanne. Um, ah. Uh, Cezanne did a bunch of 
still lives. Um, so I may not know what the title is called, but some of my favorite still lives are one are ones that he does a fruit. It's fruit. Um, okay, so I, I really love those. I feel like I'm gonna go like some peaches in a bowl, you know. Same vibe. Same but vibe. Not the same name. Ooh. What would they be called? Still life number four. It's literally fruit and fruit. Fruit and fruit. It's literally blank and blank. Um, Name some fruits. Um, pears. No. Apples. Yeah. Apples and oranges. Yeah. There you go. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Okay. Okay. We'll do one little bonus. This is not... A painting. Oh, okay. you're not gonna know what it is. Okay, I suspect I would be quite impressed. But you know, I just wanna. It's not just paintings. Um, Animal Crossing has okay. sculptures as well. Oh, that's cool. And I've really been focusing on the paintings, but I just wanted to include this little piece that I thought was pretty cool. Okay, this is called the Tremendous Statue, and I'll just read the description because we're not here. <laughs> oh, I should have learned how to say this. H O U M U W U Ding, by artist unknown. 1200 BCE. What? This bronze ding from ancient China is oh. the largest and heaviest ever found. The script on the inside suggests it was created to honor the king's mother. So yeah, oh, it's just like cool. it's like a chest or something, and it's yeah. that coppery green color. So that's cool. Yeah, I really need to get some more sculptures, but I that's just... not, that's almost not like a sculpture. It feels like well, a, it's, it's not a sculpture. A, yeah, a you're right. It's more object. of a structure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but they do have an, a an artifact. Sculpture. Cool. Okay, are you ready? Yes. This is the last one. Okay. Is this the big finale or we got this, one? This is the big finale. Oh, this is the big finale. Okay, okay. Moving painting. You're gonna get it. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> a painting of the Roman goddess Blank riding a scallop shell. After being born in the ocean, the name Blank is said to actually be a nickname given to the artist's brother who was built like a barrel. Why this nickname was transferred between siblings is a mystery lost in the ages. Oh, wow. Okay. What do you think that might be, Well, Bianca? I feel as though I'm going to go with Botticelli's Earth Venus. You're right. Isn't that you beautiful? You have this in your yes, museum? Yes, I got that like four days ago, Bianca. I got that literally just in time for you to wow. see it. Look, it looks stunning on it, your wall. It I must really say. does. Oh, she's gorgeous. Yeah. Do you know what you need next? What? To accompany this piece is Botticelli's Primavera. So, um... Primavera and Birth of Venus are these works by Botticelli that are done of mythological figures rather than kind of these Christian figures mm -hmm. that um, were maybe more popular during the time Botticelli was alive and they accompany one another. So it's oh. likely that they were commissioned by mm -hmm. the Medici family at once, but in the, in the Uffizi, they, if you have, I'm going to, for the camera, like, if Botticelli's Birth of Venus over, is over here, then in the gallery, Primavera is okay. over here. On the so, opposite wall. Yes, on the opposite wall. So I feel like next you need Primavera. And then I don't know if Red has that painting. I'll have to check. You gotta, can we make a call to the people at Animal Crossing? Yeah, we'll try. Wow, it looks beautiful. It looks great yeah. on your wall. Fantastic. So well, that's my collection so far. It, it's great. It's a very good collection. Um, so. Very white male collection. Indeed. So I feel like um, the people at Animal Crossing, if they're listening, let's get some women artists. I feel like Artemisia definitely belongs in your museum. You could definitely get um, Artemisia Ganeleschi if you're if because you, I feel like her vibe is kind of like um, Renaissance, very much Renaissance yes. or like I don't mo know moving if they into have more Renaissance or Impressionism is kind of your your era. Right yeah, now. maybe that's just for me personally, like. I think honestly that's kind of the art that I like. Yeah. So I don't know if that's just me buying those things. Oh, but also okay. I don't know that they have a super wide range. Have you seen crossing. modern art come through like modern Not and contemporary looking art? Anything super come modern. through red. Okay, that's really interesting. It's pretty much older stuff. Older like yeah. the masters. Yeah. Yeah. Masters, quote unquote. Um, well, that was really fun. I feel good that I got the basics. Um <laughs> hopefully I that's not too embarrassing no. for me. I mean, I didn't know any of those existed. Okay. Well, well I knew a couple of them. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Alyssa, for being here. Thank you for suggesting the game and playing it with us. Um, if you yourself are playing Animal Crossing and you have Animal Crossing art, I want to like see some more of it because I want to see yeah. a little bit more of like the breadth. I wonder like what else people are, are getting if yeah, they're getting yeah. anything else in their museum. Right. 
Um, that's really cool. And hopefully, yeah, I, I think that's really interesting that they're gravitating towards the the master, old masters. And uh, I feel like, you know, Animal Crossing Nintendo, if you're hiring, I feel like I could be your um, your blathers. You know, you need blathers. Blathers is kind of sexy. Let's at, just have it be said. At Animal Crossing HQ. You know. Cool. Well, is there anything that you want to plug? I mean, we allow that question to most of our guests. Do you want to plug like where you work? Do you want to plug your Instagram? Do you have anything like, upcoming that you want to talk about? I really definitely do not want to plug my Instagram. <laughs> Can I just plug something that I'm passionate about called, can you please be nice to your veterinarians and stop yelling at us and being mean? Cause like, it's yes. really rude. And you can definitely plug that. COVID has really made, um, veterinary medicine very stressful. We're very busy and regular vets are very busy and therefore emergency vets are very busy and yelling at us because you have to wait for an hour or two or three or six. It doesn't help anything. Right. And so just everyone, how about in general, be nice to other people, but yeah, stop yelling at your veterinarians because it makes me go home and cry. (laughs) (laughs) Don't yell at your vets. They work very hard to save lives. Um, I'm always just like so impressed whenever you're like talking to me about your day and the work that you're doing. It's like, I, I could never do anything like that, first of all. So it's just, it's very impressive. And I admire that a lot. So oh, thank, you. thank you for being a very good vet. And I would never yell at you. Really you would cool. never yell at me. In all 12 years, I seriously don't think you've ever yelled at me. No, I would be Have like- Have I ever yelled at you? No, I can't I've imagine. i to you. Yes, to you about other things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you're a bad man. No. Um, Cool. Well, thanks so much. And with that, I think we will talk to you on Tuesday. Bye, everyone. Bye. Art Pop Talk's executive producers are me, Bianca Martucci-Fink. And me, Gianna Martucci-Fink. Music and sounds are by Josh Turner, and photography is by Adrian Turner. And our graphic designer is Sid Hammond.